So this next session, we've got three uh, speakers for this session. It's, so it's going to be a little bit different. We've asked our presenters to give us some short, sharp presentations on a particular clinical issue and hopefully get some tips and pearls to take back to practice. So going first, I'll invite Ben back up to talk about itch. Thanks. So itch can be very difficult to treat. We know that um, it's very complex, the why patients get itch. Um, there's a lot of uh, new medications that are going to come out soon. We know for atopic dermatitis, there's going to be an interleukin-31, which is currently in trials, which can help with itch. There's an interleukin-413 as well. Um, which would hopefully come out by the end of the year. And we know that there's all these different pathways and then all these different targets for itch. The main thing is we need to break the itch scratch cycle. So we know that if patients itch, they end up scratching, they compromise their skin barrier, then irritants and allergens come into their skin and it causes inflammation. And this is a good picture here because you can see how someone can look completely normal, then over time, they end up getting a lot of inflammation here, all that redness. You can see they've got a little bit of scale as well and a lot of swelling happening in their face. Here, this is lichenification, so a lot of thickening of the skin. You can see the little holes there, which are targets for infection to enter. And if patients pick at their skin, they end up getting this thing called pruigo. So the key questions asked on history is, is the itch localised or generalised? Then I ask, is there a rash? And if there's a rash, does it correlate with where the itch is? Because a lot of patients point at lesions such as seborrheic keratosis and say that that's where it's itchy. Then I also ask if there's a history of atopy. With examination, these are the key things. So look for a rash, look for dermatographism, look for eczema, dry skin, or blisters. So there's a whole lot of different causes for itch, so whether they be from the skin, things like eczema, lichen planus, psoriasis, urticaria, systemic things like diabetes, you can get liver problems, kidney problems, you can get neurological issues, so compression syndromes, you can get psychiatric causes of itch as well. What I want to do is just talk about the five most common causes. This is the most common thing that I see is just dry skin, especially in the elderly and especially in people in winter because they overheat their skin. Uh, certain medications such as diuretics and cholesterol lowering medications can increase your risk of getting dry skin. And we know that if they have other comorbidities like thyroid problems, liver problems, kidney problems or infections, that can increase the risk of getting dry skin and cause their itch. The goal with this is to use a soap-free wash, lots of moisturizers, and then if they've got any inflammation to use topical steroids. Scabies. Um, the key things to ask on history, are there any close contacts with the itch? Is the itch worse at night? Is the itch worse after having a shower? And then does it involve the scalp? Because scabies typically doesn't affect the head and neck. Then patients typically won't tell you that they've got things around their nipples or the genitals and you really need to have a look. So because those are the areas which, if it is there, then you've pretty much clinched the diagnosis and then also have a look in the armpits as well as on the wrists and the web spaces. In children, they can get it around the palms and soles, and that might just be the presenting symptom in children, just these little pus, pustules on their palms. The way I treat it is topical permethrin, 5% from the neck down, which they leave on for 12 hours. So I tell them to apply it at about 7 o'clock at night, wash off in the morning, and then repeat it seven days later. They need to treat all their close contacts and they need to, at the same time, they need to wash all their bed sheets, pillows, pajamas in hot water the next day. With eczema, the key things to ask on history, do they have a history of atopy, so asthma or allergic rhinitis? Have a look to see whether there's any involvement of the cubital fossa or popliteal fossae, and then treat it with, by avoiding soap, using a soap-free wash, moisturizers, and topical steroids. If it's severe, they may require bleach baths, wet dressings, immunosuppressants, and phototherapy. Urticaria, by definition, the wheels should last less than 24 hours. If they last more than 24 hours, then it's not urticaria. Usually, 
um, they get coexistent dermatographism. Acute urticaria should last less than six weeks, and the different causes include infection, medications, and food. I generally don't give prednisolone because I know that as soon as you stop the prednisolone, it generally rebounds quite badly. So I use antihistamines up to four times a day, and I like to mix them up. So they might take cedirizine at night, loratadine at lunchtime, and fexofenadine at breakfast time. Chronic urticaria can last. Uh, chronic urticaria lasts greater than six weeks, and it can be quite difficult to manage. In about 50% of cases, we don't find an underlying cause, but we still look for it. Things like lupus, thyroid medications, helicobacter. Um, we also ask them if they've got any systemic symptoms because sometimes uh, chronic urticaria is associated with this and sometimes other diseases are associated with this. Um, with dermatographism, a lot of normal people have this where they scratch their skin and they get this erythema plus some wheeling effect there. The key thing is to take antihistamines and avoid very hot water and rubbing and to, use, and to wear loose clothes. With chronic spontaneous urticaria, this is chronic urticaria that lasts more than six weeks where all the other causes have been ruled out. And what we do is antihistamines up to four times a day. And then now um, on the PBS is omelizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against IgE, which works in about 70 to 80% of people. Um, we still use things such as phototherapy and dapsone and other immunosuppressants to treat this. Natalgia parasthetica uh, is where patients typically get pain or paresthesia or numbness here in the inferior medial aspect of their scapula. It's likely due to be uh, due to the impingement of nerves. Traditional itch treatments fail, um, but we do try things like menthol. Um, some people use capsaicin, doxapin, amitriptyline, and some people go get physio and acupuncture. In the elderly, the four things I look for, scabies, senile xerosis, medication-induced itch, as well as pre-bullus bullus pemphigoid, where this typically looks like eczema all over or they just itchy all over without a rash, and then they develop blisters later on, and that might even be like a year or two later. So what if they have no rash but they're itchy all over? Well, that's this one here. So we need to rule out xerosis look for any systemic disease, and do a whole lot of blood tests. So these are the blood tests that I do for patients who have ongoing itch without a rash. Firstly, I do a full blood count and film, looking for any abnormalities there, because I know anemia can cause itch as well, ESI and CRP, liver and renal function tests, thyroid function tests, iron studies, B12 and folate, a fasting blood glucose, serum protein electrophoresis, and IgE level. And if there's no rash and there's still an itch, I treat them with a soap-free wash and molens, topical steroids. I add on antihistamines if um, there's dermatographism. But the key thing to tell patients is how to put the creams on properly. Now, there are a lot of different brands out there. There's QV, Cetaphil, Aveeno, Dermavin, KenK, all these ones there. I don't find that one's better than the other. It's typically patient preference. I tell patients to avoid the red ones, Sorbeline and Lucas Pawpaw, as I know there have been reports of contact dermatitis with these products. So in the shower, I tell patients to use a soap-free wash, so choose one of them, and they use a soap-free wash. Then as soon as they get out of the shower, they dry themselves and they put the steroid ointment onto any parts, part of their skin that's itchy. Now, ointments work better than creams, and they're more oily, so they have a moisturising effect. And it's important to use as much ointment as they need early on, and then over time we taper it down. Then they wait a few minutes after putting the steroid ointments on, and then they put moisturisers all over their skin. If they have any involvement of the face, they can use topical calcium urine inhib inhibitors such as pimecolimus, and for the scalp they can use mometasone lotion. If they have very dry skin, a thick moisturiser such as Dermes um, is good, but some people feel that this is a bit awkward, especially if they're going to school or work, so the best thing to do is use that at night. Now, a different method was published by Tim O'Brien where what he said was you get the patient to soak in an entire... Uh, sorry, you get the patient to soak in a bath 
for 20 minutes and then when the patient gets out of the bath they don't dry themselves they just put the steroid ointment all over their body apart from their face and scalp then they wear pajamas and they go to sleep and then in the morning they have a shower with a soap free wash and then put a moisturizer on all over and then they do this every day for seven days and over time they just reduce the frequency of it now this is what i do if if things aren't improving, firstly, 1% menthol and aqueous or sorbolene cream, and you can get 100 grams in one repeat. And if you want to increase the quantity, then you just call authority. So I typically see patients um, start them on that, and if they um, think that it's working, then I just call up and get them with authority a couple of weeks later. With pregabalin and gabapentin, start very low, especially in the elderly. Doxapin, amitriptyline, use and then phototherapy I find works really well and then if nothing really works then I'd go on to these treatments such as mycophenolate and cyclosporin. These are other treatments that have been reported. I typically don't use these but a lot of people do. Um, there have been reports that naltrexone is effective um, but I've never used it for this condition. This uh, is from um, a journal article about what the interventions are for pruritus. As you can see here, even though the level of ed evidence isn't that great, that everyone should moisturise, have a cool environment, avoid irritants, break the itch scratch cycle, stress reduction, behavioural therapy, all that. And then you use topical steroids, calcium urine inhibitors, menthol and capsaicin. And then you can use things like the antihistamines and all the immunosuppressants and doxapin. So the key thing is, well, when, do we, um, when should you refer a patient? Well, if the patient's not improving, if they start to develop blisters, or if they're erythrodermic, meaning that they're red all over their skin, or if they've got a rash and um, it's of unknown cause, or if you're unsure on, or unhappy with the progress. And finally, there's a conference on itch if anyone wants to attend later in the year but they'll talk about all the newer treatments that are coming out. Any questions? put sorbolene on, do you put the, um, put the, uh, any steroid cream on? Yeah, so what they do is they put the topical steroid on first, yeah. um, and then they wait a few minutes and then put the moisturiser on after that. So they can wait five minutes and then put the moisturiser all over. So if they have itch, say, in their, and this is how I treat eczema as well, so if they have itch in their, um, on their arms, then they put the steroid ointment on their arms, wait a few minutes, and then put the moisturiser all over their body. No, so it really depends on the type. So 1% hydrocortisone is quite weak, so that's fine for the face. For the body, you can use other ones like mimetazone or methylprednisolone or sepinate. Uh, the question was, how long do you use the strong steroids for? Well, you use it twice a day and then see them again in about four weeks, see how it's all going and to see whether they're improving. And over time, they can taper it down. So if the itch goes away, they don't need to put the cream on. What's your opinion about these commercial body washes that are often very perfumed and do you reckon they often cause people to get dry skin? Yeah, I do. I think there's, um, there was, uh, there are, the more expensive the cream, doesn't mean that it's going to be more effective. A lot of people go out and pay a lot of money for all the expensive stuff when there are cheaper things which work a lot better, I find. And the more perfumes and more ingredients they have in a moisturiser, the more likely they are to develop an irritant contact dermatitis or a reaction to it. It's better just to stay real, really simple.
Do you have a broad guideline as to how often people should be using the stronger topical corticosteroids into the future? So someone with um, atopic eczema that um, I've heard some dermatologists say before that if they use it five days of the month, then that's reasonable use, not expected to be associated with long-term side effects. Do you have a broad rule like that that you use? So it depends where on the body it is. So, for example, on the face, I don't like using potent topical steroids at all. Um, sometimes you can't help it. So, if, for example, in a little child who has really bad facial eczema, you can use um, the topical steroids for three days. I do it twice a day for three days, and then I go down to the topical permecral imus uh, twice a day ongoing. And the studies have shown that if you use the topical permecrolimus or topical tacrolimus on an ongoing basis, it's perfectly safe, especially around the eyes in children um, and adults as well. With regards to potent topical steroids elsewhere, um, there have been some reports that as you use the topical steroids over time, they, use the, they lose the efficacy. So um, sometimes it's worth changing the topical steroid around. So you might feel that you use, say, bimethasone dipropionate for, for a few weeks and then over time the patient just doesn't respond to it. So they might respond the first week and then over time they don't and then you switch it to a different one. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yes, I think so. Yeah. Very, um, you know, no. 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 In general, I find that a lot of patients don't put enough steroid ointments on. Um, the more they use, the better. I'd rather them use more steroid ointments than go on oral prednisolone. And then over time, we just taper off the topical steroids. Thanks.